Hello lovely viewers, you are most welcome to our channel Poetry Online. In this video, we shall be presenting to you the summary and analysis of the book So Long a Letter by Mariama Ba from chapter 1 to chapter 27. Kindly subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to get updates on all our new videos. Once again, let us assure you of a very interesting discussion. Get ready for this lesson. So long a letter begins when Ramatulai, a Senegalese woman living in Dakar, the country's capital, decides to write a letter to her old friend Aisetu, who lives in America. This letter is occasioned by the sudden death of Mudo, Ramatulai's estranged husband. In keeping with Muslim custom, Ramatulai must observe a miraz, a 40-day period of isolation and mourning. Over the course of this period, she keeps a diary, which she eventually intends to send to Aisetu. Ramatulai begins her letter by reflecting on the long funeral proceedings following Muda's death. Senegalese Muslim custom dictate that Ramatulai should serve as a host to all the mourners and well-wishers, opening her house to them and providing them with food and drink. This strikes Ramatulai as a grave injustice, as Mojo, in his final years, wanted nothing to do with her. The mourners virtually sack her house, and though they brought gifts, thus, mostly bank notes, most of them ended up in the hands of Mojo's second wife, Benito, and her greedy mother, Lady Mother-in-law. Ramon Tulai goes on to reflect on her marriage to Mojo. She cannot understand what led him to lose interest in her. Their first years together, as sweethearts, and then, as a married couple, seemed hopeful. They married, despite the protestation of Ramatulai's family, who saw Mojo as something of a love. In her diary, she admits that they were right and wonders why, despite her education, she chose him over the more sensible option, Dauda Din, an older and more established financially stable man. I said his marriage, like Ramatulai's, also disintegrated. Around the time that Ramatulai married Mojo, I settle married Maudu, an overall model citizen. The two were greatly in love. However, Maudu is of noble birth, while I settle is merely the daughter of a goldsmith. Maudu's family, in particular his mother, Auntie Nabu, objected to that union. In an effort to undermine the marriage, Auntie Nabu traveled to her ancestral home and convinced her brother to relinquish one of his daughters, thus Auntie Nabu's namesake, to take care of her. Auntie Nabu proceeded to raise and train young Nabu. Then, when the girl was of proper age, Auntie Nabu begged Maudu to take young Nabu as a second wife. Maudu, fearing that his mother would become distressed and fall ill if he declined, agreed to marry young Nabu. He assured Aisatu that he did not love young Nabu but he also had children with her. Aisetu could not accept this and decided to divorce him. She focused on her education, received a degree in diplomacy, and moved to America to work in the Senegalese embassy. Meanwhile, Ramosun Lai was enduring her own marital misfortune. Her daughter, Daba, befriended a girl named Benito. Benito spoke often of a sugar daddy, an older man who brought her clothes. After a while, Benito's family began to pressure her into leaving her education behind and marrying the man for his money. Benito reluctantly agreed. Ramatulai was disappointed by this news, but not otherwise suspicious. Some days later, Maudo, Modo's brother Tamsil, and a local imam appeared at Ramatulai's house. Together, they informed her that Benito's sugar daddy was in fact Ramatulai's husband Modo and that Benito would soon be her co-wife. Ramoto Lai was left heartbroken and effectively abandoned as Modo began a new life with Benito. Despite this, she decided to remain married to Modo, accepting a fate as if it was a duty to fulfill. Her children protested, but she remained steadfast. Now, Modo has died and Ramoto Lai must navigate a strange situation of being forced to mourn a man who abandoned her. As Emeraz draws to a close, she is approached by Tamsil, 
who announces that he will marry her. Ramos Villa is deeply offended by his grass proposal and tells him off in front of Maldo, an imam. Later, Dauda Dim proposes to her. Though he does so considerably, more tag than Tamsil, Ramos Villa rejects him as well. She resolves to focus her efforts on raising her children. Thanks to the increasingly prevalent forces of modernity, Ramos Villa's adolescent children become exposed to a host of new dangers, dangers from which she feels they must be protected from. While playing baseball in the street, two of Ramos Villa's sons are run over and injured by a wayward motorcycle. She catches three of her daughters smoking. Aiseto's namesake gets pregnant out of wedlock. Ramos Villa responds to all of this crisis with strength, equanimity, and poise. Ramon Tulai concludes her long letter by anticipating I settle some pending returning to Senegal. She looks forward to seeing her friend and trusts that, despite the fiscal changes they have endured, their friendship will still be strong. Chapter 1 Ramon Tulai, the narrator, living in Dakar, Senegal, addresses her friend I settle, who lives far away in America. Ramon Tulai writes that, she has received Isetu's letter, and that, by way of reply, she has decided to write a diary. This diary, she decides, will serve as a prop into her distress, though she doesn't yet reveal what has caused this distress. First, she recalls her childhood with Isetu, listing off a series of discreet images, the two of them walking along the same road to Quranic school, and the two of them burying their baby teeth in the same hole. The immediate intimacy of Ramon Tulai's address establishes how close these two friends are and how close they remain despite the physical distance between them. At first, Ramon Tulai's promise to keep a diary that will also serve as a letter to Isetu seems like a contradiction. That is, one typically thinks of a diary as private and a letter inherently shared. Yet, Ramon Tulai's memory from their childhood together makes it clear that the two friends share everything and thus this diary or letter gives the novel its unique form. Ramon Tulai then reveals the cause of her distress. Yesterday you were divorced, she writes. Today I am a widow. Ramon Tulai's estranged husband, Mojo, has suddenly died of a heart attack. Ramon Tulai describes why Setu, the phone call she received, informing her of the news, as well as the trip to the hospital and her encounter with the buddy. She explains that Maudu, Maudu's doctor friend and Isetu's ex-husband, was called to the scene but arrived too late. All his attempts to resuscitate Maudu were for naught, and describes his sadness with a certain tenderness. Distraught and confused, Ramon Tulai's consolation in remembered verses of the Quran Although Ramatulai is estranged from Mordo, she receives the news of his death with a solemnity, awe, and devotion that her faith demands and with the grief of a loving spouse. Similarly, she expresses her tenderness toward Mordo without restraint, despite his estrangement from the letter's addressee, her friend Aisetu. For Ramatulai, death is a sacred matter, the gravity of which overcomes, if only for a moment, feelings of animosity or remorse. Here, we also see the strength of Ramatulai's Islamic faith and the way that it informs her life, emotions, and decision-making on almost every level. Chapter 2 The day after Modo's death, droves of mourners appear at Ramatulai's house to pay their respect. Modo's close relatives appear as well, and the women among them help to make the funeral preparations bringing incense, holy water, white muslin, and dark wrappers to the hospital in order to dress a body. In accordance with custom, Modo's second wife, Benito, is installed in Ramatulai's house to receive guests alongside her. Ramatulai is bothered by her presence, but ultimately feels pity towards the girl. The male mourners form a funeral procession and accompany the body to its final resting place, while the woman stay behind. Mother's sister ritually undo Ramatulai and Benito's hair. Ramatulai's description of the funeral preparation 
demonstrates just how much custom and tradition such race Senegalese culture and experience does. Further, it demonstrates that Senegalese Muslim rituals typically delineate the extent complementary roles for men and women. Ramos Ulai's complex feeling towards Benito, her co-wife, include both indignation at having to associate with her husband's second wife and a kind of maternal feeling. After all, Benito is young enough to be Ramatulai's daughter. Custom dictates that Ramatulai serves as a hospitable host to mother's family and to a co wife's family, providing them with food and lodging and generally accommodating their every need. Ramatulai dress this responsibility, most of all because it calls on her to surrender her personality and dignity in the interest of serving her estranged relatives. Mother's sister showers praises and words of consolation over Ramotulai and Benito, but it bothers Ramotulai that they give equal consideration to both. That is, Benito was married to Modo for only five years, while Ramotulai was married to him for 30. The man returned from the funeral procession and offered condolence to the woman in a highly ritualized fashion. In order to satisfy the demands of custom, Ramatulai must essentially erase herself, render herself transparent, and reduce herself to an object in the service of men. The fact that she and Benito receive the same amount of attention only underlines the fact that Ramatulai's role as the aggrieved wife has in the eyes of the other mourners overwhelmed any and all of her individual characteristics as a human being. Chapter 3 The Funeral Ceremony continues into its third day. Now, all sort of people come out of the woodwork to pay their respect and much of the hospitality of their grief. Ramatulai's house is essentially trashed by the crowd. The men and women occupy different sides of the parlor. The men occasionally shout over at the women to chastise them for gossiping loudly or not showing the solemnity that the occasion demands. Many of the guests present money to Ramatulai and Simodo's family. Ramatulai explains that these customary gifts once consisted of unquantifiable goods such as livestock and millet, but now everyone simply presents their grief with banknotes and tries to one-up everyone else by giving the most cash. The proceeds are divided up among Ramatulai, Benito and her family and Modo's family. Benito's mother and Modo's sister gets the lion's share, leaving Ramatulai destitute in comparison. Ramatulai experiences firsthand the marked disconnect between the premise of dignity on which a funeral ritual is founded and the indignity that a ritual actually can create. But while she's skeptical of the traditions she's expected to follow, she's also nostalgic for traditions that have been abandoned or otherwise corrupted. The exchange of cash and lieu of actual gifts strikes her as somewhat appalling. The unequal apportioning of gifts money between her and her family in-law only underlines the illogic of custom for custom's sake and the way even tradition of generosity and selfishness can be easily twisted. Finally, Benito and the relatives clear out, leaving destruction in their wake. Ramutu Lai's floors are blackened and her walls are strained with oil and trash litters the house. In their absence, Ramutu Lai now must confront her mirrors, a period of four months and ten days that she must spend in solitude and mourning in accordance with custom. She's apprehensive but faces her duty and resolve, writing that her heart concurs to the demands of religion. Despite her clear and outspoken discomfort with many of the demands of her religion and culture, Ramatulai is determined to meet them head on and operate within them rather than against them. This is one of the first glimpses of Ramatulai's particular brand of stoicism and quiet courage. Chapter 4 The Miras also demands that Ramatulai and the family in law meet to strip Modo and reveal the secret he kept during his lifetime. Mostly, this involves laying bare his financial debt. It is then revealed that the Czech villa in which Modo had been living with Benito and Benito's mother was acquired on a bank loan originally granted to both Modo and Ramatulai. Even though the deed has Modo's name on it, 
Ramos will lie essentially help pay for the house. However, Modo's lavish treatment of Benito and her mother, thus, he paid for their pilgrimage to Mecca, bought them cars, and, to Ramoto Lai's horror, provided Benito with a monthly allowance after pulling her out of school, has led the two to think that they are guaranteed the house. It seems also that they have begun fraudulently removing furniture from the house even before the estate is settled. It becomes clear that Modo has used his privileged position to exploit Ramoto Lai's financial independence. His family intends to prolong the exploitation into the future, and it doesn't seem like there's much Ramoto Lai can do about it. Ramoto Lai's horror at Benito's removal from school establishes Ramoto Lai as someone who cares deeply about education, particularly for young women, and once more illustrates her conflicted maternal feeling towards her young co wife. Chapter 5 Alone again with her thoughts, Ramoto Lai becomes distressed. She wonders what could have possibly caused Modo to abandon her, not to mention their 12 children, in order to marry the 17 year old Benito. Ramoto Lai compares her fate to that of the blind, disabled, and destitute, asking how those in worse situations than hers find strength, moral fortitude, and even heroism in their disadvantage and distress. Like the blind and the disabled, Ramoto Lai's position of social disadvantage has everything to do with the circumstances of her birth and nothing to do with her character. He assertion that the blind can still act heroically in quiet ways within the confines of their societal disadvantage reflects her own brand of stoic feminism. Chapter 6 Ramoto Lai recalls meeting Mother for the first time while on a trip to a teacher's training college with Aisetu, addressing Mother directly in a second person, she remembers asking him to dance and their ensuing romance, which endured even after Modo went off to study law in France. Modo, she explains, felt homesick and lonely, and the whole time he was there, he wrote to her often. Modo's dissatisfaction in France illustrates a conundrum that then faced the educated in Senegal. Most pathways to higher education also demanded assimilation to French culture, that is, the culture of the colonizer and oppressor. Separately, Ramoto Lai's use of direct address illustrates her continued feeling and intimacy towards Modo, even after estrangement and death has separated them. Upon his return to Senegal, Modo and Ramoto Lai prepared to marry. Modo also introduced his friend, Maudu, to Aisetu. Ramoto Lai's mother was skeptical of her daughter's choice. However, Ramoto Lai now understands her skepticism. Ramoto Lai and her mother belong to the first generation of women fighting for empowerment in Senegal, and her mother wanted her daughter to have a husband that would be equal to Ramoto Lai's intellect and ambition. It seems that by marrying Modo, an idler, Ramoto Lai surrendered her freedom to a man who was beneath her. Now, she has nothing to show for it. Ramoto Lai's disagreement with her mother raises a question that vexes the entire novel. Are traditional family life, religious family, and motherhood fundamentally at odds with female empowerment? Does a woman surrender essential freedoms just by choosing to marry, or just by marrying the wrong kind of person? Chapter 7 Ramoto Lai remembers with fondness her and I said to his friend, which is to say, white school teacher. All the students came from different cultures within French West Africa and she treated them all equally and instilled universal morals in them, lifting them out of the box of tradition, superstition, and custom. The acceptance offered to Ramoto Lai by her school teacher stands in contrast to the alienation Modo felt in France. Ramoto Lai's admiration for the teacher demonstrates a certain optimism. There is a faith that education and progress do not have to include the indignity and erasure of false assimilation into the culture of the oppressor. Ramoto Lai wonders why despite her education, she chose Modo over Dauda Dane, an intelligent, mature, wealthy doctor who tried unsuccessfully to court her. She rejected him against the wishes of her parents who saw Dauda 
as the most stable practical option. At the time, Ramatulai's rejection of Dauda was in some sense an expression of empowerment and a rejection of tradition. But now, she wonders whether accepting a more practical option might have ultimately offered her a greater freedom in the long run. Chapter 8 Ramatulai shifts the attention to Aisetu's controversial engagement to Maldo. Aisetu is of modest birth, her father is a goldsmith, while Mordo is a nobility, his mother is a princess of the Sine. In the eyes of tradition, it was a total mismatch, and at the time of the engagement, everyone in the town gossiped angrily about the scandal. The widespread shock in response to the engagement demonstrates just how strong a grave custom has over social relations in Senegal, or at least the parts of the country that Maria Mabar describes. Ramatulai uses Aisetu's father's profession to discuss some of the broader social changes happening in Senegal. Aisetu's younger brother would not take up their father's profession, pursuing a Western education instead. While Ramatulai acknowledges the importance of education, she is a school teacher after all. She is wary of overemphasizing it. For one, education is still largely inaccessible for the poor, and in any case, schooling is not necessarily right for everyone. What will the dropouts do? Modernization has begun to render obsolete the traditional crafts like goldsmithing that will have otherwise served as an alternative to those not receiving the higher education. This conflict between modernization and tradition is an internal debate from what will lie right. Modernization is not, Ramatulai suggests, a universal good. While it is necessary for the progress of Senegal as a newly independent nation, it also seems to compromise important facets of Senegalese cultural identity. While Ramatulai cannot offer a solution to the conundrum, she seems to suggest that the internal debate is important to preserve. That is, perhaps, the solution lies partly in the very process of debating. Chapter 9 Ramatulai and Aisetu married their fiancés around the same time and together they endured the joys and frustrations of their new marital life. Ramatulai is pestered constantly by her mother-in-law and sister-in-laws who day after day drop in unannounced and abuse her hospitality. She is also exasperated to discover that despite her professional life as a teacher and despite the help of a few maids, the brunt of household duties still fall to her. For a certain part, her family-in-law does not respect her and barely acknowledges her existence. Mother's family's careless treatment of Ramatulai is a form of objectification. In their eyes, she is little more than a provider of service. Even her professional success cannot save her from the rule assigned to her by custom. Ramatulai and Aisetu's friendship provide them with an escape. However, with their spouses and in-laws, they endure their oppression silently, but with each other, they can express their frustrations openly. In their precious free time together, Ramatulai and Aisetu take long walks together along the coast and relax in Aisetu's beautiful home. They find solace in nature and the open air. They find solace too in their professional lives. They are both school teachers, and the satisfaction they derive from helping young children is incomparable to anything they feel at home. The openness and natural beauty of the coast stands in sharp contrast to the confines of their home. Against the claims of custom and tradition, Ramatulai and Aisetu find more fulfillment in their friendship and professional life than their conventionally sacred household duties as wives. Chapter 10 Mordo rises to the top ranks of the trade union for which he works. Meanwhile, Senegalese is in the midst of achieving its independence. Debates over the right path forward. Thus, how best to share the history of colonial exploitation and bring a new republic into being grips the country. Ramatulai sees her generation as occupying a privileged but difficult position between two distinct eras. Mordo leads his trade union in collaboration with the government. He is skeptical, however, of the hasty establishment of too many embassies, which he sees as an unnecessary drain on Senegalese special resources. 
Ramos Ulai and those around her feel personally invested into the political debate taking place, and the power before them is somewhat fraught. The modal skepticism of the embassies illustrates one of the biggest dilemmas facing independent Senegal. Modernization seems to demand participation in an increasingly global economy, and yet, doing so also seems to come at the expense of the internal stability and often at the expense of Senegalese unique culture. At least, when globalization means assimilation into an oppressive Western culture. Chapter 11 While admitting that she must be reopening old wounds for a friend, Ramotu Lai proceeds to describe the breakup of Isetu's marriage. She explains that Maudu's mother, Isetu's aunt Nabu, simply could not accept that her son had married a woman of low birth. Nabu resolved to visit her brother, Faba Diop, who is a customary chief in Diakau, a rural town far inland. After a long journey, she visited the tomb of her noble ancestors, which is located in the town, and pays her respect there. Nabu is received in her father's house like a queen. She is served the choicest base of meal, and relatives from all over the area come to visit her. Toward the end of her visit, she tells her brother that she needs a child by her side. That is, her children have married and her house is now empty. Faba, hearing this, immediately offers to surrender his own daughter, Nabu's namesake, to Nabu's care. As Nabu returns home with a young Nabu in town, Nabu's symbolic journey to the country's interior is like a journey back in time. The rural town in Diakau is still very much under the spell of tradition, unlike cosmopolitan Dakar. And while the rituals Nabu rehearses there are antiqued, Ramos Ulaya still describes them with a degree of awe and respect. They are somewhat beautiful and powerful, even if they ultimately quicken Isetu's personal troubles. Still, the case with which Faber offers up his young daughter is certainly appalling. She has no say in the matter, and is exchanged like a mere commodity. It's also worth noting that Aunt Nabu, a woman, has internalized the sexist aspect of her culture seemingly as much as any man and feels no qualms about accepting her needs solely as an object. Chapter 12 Under Aunt Nabu's guidanceship and with the help of Ramon Sulai, young Nabu is enrolled in French school and after a few years becomes a midwife. One day, Aunt Nabu summons Mado and tells him that Faba has offered young Nabu to Mado as a wife. Aunt Nabu employs Mado to accept. If he doesn't, she says she will surely die of shame. Mado takes this to heart and agrees to marry young Nabu. The whole community learns about this before I settle does. Reluctantly, Mado brings the news to her, telling her that he is agreeing to the marriage only to appease his mother. That is, he does not love Nabu. Isetu goes along with this for a while, but when Mordo begins to have children with young Nabu, Isetu leaves, leaving him a letter which Ramotu Lai reproduces for the readers, explaining in direct terms that she cannot accept his decision. While at first, it seems that Mordo maintains an entirely practical view of his marriage to that of young Nabu, his actions, namely having children with his new wife, undercuts his claim of pragmatism. Maudu tells Aisetu his decision is a matter of principle, not passion. And yet, Aisetu's uncompromising and unpassioned rejection of him is the most principled decision perhaps in the whole novel. Ramos Ulai's role in all of this, in the background, never intervening on the part of either Maudu or Aisetu, illustrates her more conservative and reserved tendencies. Now, free from her marriage, Aisetu turns to books, and begins taking her education seriously. Ramon Sulai admires this greatly. Isetu returns to school, receives a degree in interpretation, and gets a job at the Senegalese embassy in America. Meanwhile, Maudu finds himself dissatisfied with Nabu. She does not keep up with her house the way Isetu had, and she is constantly receiving visitors from her hometown. In letters, Maudu begs Isetu to return, but she refuses. Despite his misery, Maudu continues to have children with Nabu. When Ramotu Lai confronts him about this, Maudu can only explain himself with a crude analogy 
He is a starving man, and Nabu is the nearest place of food. This disgusts Ramotli lying. I settle flourishes outside the confines of marriage and custom, embracing modernism and education, and going so far as leaving the entire country behind. For his part, Maudu, Mrs. Aisetu, for reasons that have nothing to do with her and everything to do with her ability to serve him, Ramatu lies disgust at Maudu's analogy, demonstrate not just the solidarity with Aisetu, but also with Nabu, who throughout the whole ordeal has never been treated as more than just an object. Chapter 13 Ramatu Lai now decides to recount her own marital misfortune. Her teenage daughter, Daba, begins to spend a lot of time with her friend Benito. Together, they are preparing for the standardized test. Mother often offers to drive Benito home after the studying session. Benito wears expensive dresses, which she explains have been paid for by a sugar daddy. Ramatu Lai doesn't think much of this until one day, Daba explains that the sugar daddy wants to marry Benito. Ramatulai tells Daba that Benito's education is far more important and that she shouldn't cut short her youth simply because a rich man wants to marry her. Though Benito disagrees, she cannot convince her family who are attracted to the sugar daddy's money. She reluctantly accepts his marriage proposal. Ramatu Lai's emphasis on education and her wish for a successful future for Benito seems to be driven in part by a settled success after leaving Maudo. Ramatu Lai knows firsthand how difficult it is in Senegalese society for a wife to maintain both a home and a professional life. Benito's submission to her family's demands ominously echoes Maudo's submission to Auntie Nabu's demands. It seems that the older generation often forces their family members to continue within the confines of strict or outmoded customs. On the day that Benito is to be married to a sugar daddy, Modo's brother, Tamsir, Maudo, and a local imam appear at Ramotulai's house. Maudo is nowhere to be seen. After some dawdling and beating around the bush, the three men announce the reason for their visit. Modo, it turns out, as Benito's sugar daddy, and today he is taking her as a second wife. The men express their support of the marriage, which they see as a matter of God's will, though Maldo, evidently remembering Aisetu's reaction to his own second marriage, seems subdued. Ramatu lies, of course, shocked and upset. Suddenly, all of Maldo's absence in recent months begin to make sense, yet she maintains her composure, smiling thanking the men and offering them something to drink. The formality of the exchange, while supposedly customary, comes off as ridiculous and cowardly, a total breakdown of respectful communication. That is, Modo can't confront his wife himself. Depending on how you look at it, Ramon's lies so exorcism in the face of the absurd development is either tragic or empowered. At the very least, it is clear that Maintaining her composure and offering this man hospitality is no easy feat. Chapter 14 Daba, who was also kept in the dark about the true identity of Benito's sugar daddy, is infuriated and employs Ramotulai to leave Modo, just like Aisotu left Maudu. Ramotulai's neighbor, Famata, also encourages Ramotulai to leave. Famata is a groid a kind of fortune teller, and she informs her mother to lie that her future includes laughter and a new husband. Ramatu Lai rejects this prediction. However, she thinks she is too old to attract the attention of a new man and worries that if she were to leave Maudo, she would live out the rest of her life in loneliness. Increasingly distraught, and she finds herself descending into a nervous breakdown. Mother's abandonment of Ramatu Lai has left her unable to imagine that any man will find her attractive in future. Her steadfast refusal to act on Dabes and Famate's advice is at once tragic and somewhat impressive. It might be argued that she is asserting a kind of independence, rejecting the idea that she requires a man in her life at all. 
By way of illustrating her own distress, Ramatulai tells the story of her acquaintances, Jacqueline. Jacqueline, a protestant from Côte d'Ivoire, marries Samba Jack, a friend of Maldo's. Jacqueline is not used to Senegalese culture. She's treated like an outsider and is shocked when Samba begins chasing after other women. That is the relatively standard behavior of Senegalese husbands. Distressed, she begins experiencing all manners of physical pain, which no doctor can diagnose. She undergoes a host of x-rays and evasive tests, but the nature of her illness remains a mystery. That is, until a doctor diagnoses her with depression. The diagnosis alone helps Jacqueline greatly. Now that she knows the source of her illness, she turns her energies inward and begins to overcome her depression. Taking heart in the story, Ramos Ulai resolves to confront her suffering head on. She decides to remain married to Mordo. In her view, the dignified solution. For Jacqueline and the reader can assume, Ramos Ulai's mental pain manifests itself as physical pain. That is, a potent reminder of the toll that the constant stress of oppression takes on the body. The conclusion Ramotulai draws from Jacqueline's story is certainly counterintuitive. She seems to suggest that her suffering is more a matter of attitude than circumstance. Whether this conclusion should be applauded is left somewhat ambiguous by Mariamaba. Separately, Jacqueline's story illustrates a political stability that is often overlooked in the West. Just how diverse African nations and cultures are. Chapter 15 Ramos Ulai compares and contrasts Nabu and Benito. Nabu is full of poise and tags, thanks in part to Aunt Nabu's intense involvement in a moral education. Her job at a maternity home is difficult and often frustrating, but Nabu is a fighter, and in this way, Ramos Ulai sees her as a kindred spirit. In contrast, Ramos Ulai feels a kind of pity for Benito. Trapped in a marriage she never wanted, Benito can tolerate her life only by making Modo dye his hair, dress younger than his age, and lavish money on her. Some of Ramatulai's friends, horrified by her Modo's behavior, suggest that she staged a supernatural intervention using love potions or spiritual mediums to break up the marriage. However, Ramatulai rejects this suggestion as irrational. Whereas Ramatulai feels a kind of power feeling towards Nabu. They are both working women, struggling to reconcile their home life with their family life. She feels something closer to a maternal feeling towards Benito. Ramatulai's rejection of a friend's suggestion constitutes a rejection of the old ways, a rejection of superstition in favor of a kind of brutal and resigned rationalism. Instead, Ramatulai resolved to look reality in the face as she explains, reality consists of Lady Mother-in-law, that is, Benito's mother, living a pampered gilded life on Mordo's dime. It also consists of the odd couple, Mordo and Benito, going to nine clubs and dancing awkwardly to everyone's delight and embarrassment. Neither Benito nor her mother are seemingly at all interested in Mordo. They are only interested in his money. Chapter 16 as time goes on, Ramos Ulai finds that what her children originally begged her to do, to leave Mordo, is now functionally the case, as Mordo seems to have lost all interest in maintaining even the semblance of relationship with her. While Ramos Ulai did not make this choice for herself, she learns to cope with it and even enjoy her newfound independence. Being a single parent to 12 children is no easy feat however. Money is tight, and she must make certain compromises, such as making her children ride public transport, while Benito and Lady Mother-in-law drive around in fancy new car. Ramos Ulai's resolve in the face of fate she never chose for herself demonstrates an extraordinary resilience and a belief in making due with whatever life has in store. Ramos Ulai does not take direct actions on her own behalf, in a sense that she doesn't stand up to Mordo, but she at least takes the challenges of single motherhood in stride. In passing, Ramos Ulai one day 
mentions having to ride public transportation to Aisetu in a letter. In response, Aisetu immediately buys Ramotulai a car by calling in an order to the local fiat agency. Ramotulai is surprised and overjoyed. She does not know how to drive and is somewhat afraid to learn, but remains determined and overcomes her fear. Not only must Ramotulai adopt her newfound personal independence, she must adopt to Senegalese increasing modernization and globalization as represented by learning to drive an Italian car purchased for her by her friend overseas. Chapter 17 Ramatulai reflects further on the fate of her marriage. She struggles to understand why mother decided to leave her in the first place and tries to determine if there was anything she could have done to prevent his flight. She's sure, however, that she has been an exemplary wife and mother. Further, she admits that she is still devoted to Modo, despite his terrible treatment of her. She writes to her, I said to that, though she respects women who take a stand against their errant husband and leave them behind, she has never conceived of happiness outside of marriage. Ramatulai clearly did nothing to invite Modo's abandonment of her. Despite her sacrifices and invaluable contribution to her family life, she is still seen by Modo as entirely disposable. Ramatulai's confession to Aisetu shows again just how much she has internalized custom and tradition, including the idea that there can be no real happiness or fulfillment for a woman outside of marriage. Chapter 18 It is now the 40th day after Modo's death. Ramatulai writes that she has forgiven him. Then, out of the blue, Tamsir, Maudo, and Imam appear again in Ramatulai's house. Tamsir speaks, telling Ramatulai that as soon as she comes out of mourning her husband, he is willing to marry her, explaining that he prefers her to the other one, Benito. Tamsir expects to inherit Ramatulai from his dead brother, much like he would a piece of furniture. His confidence conveys a total disrespect to Ramatulai's independence and intelligence, and even her basic humanity. His reference to Benito as the other one might be laughable if it weren't so horrible. Ramatulai is infuriated by this proposal. In response, she rails against Ramsil's disrespect and presumptuousness. She tells him that he is disrespecting not only her, but his own wives and the memory of his brother. She insinuates that he is simply after his brother's properties, which Daba and her husband have recently bought. Taking a bag, Maudu begs her mother to lie to stop yelling, but she refuses. Finally, she finishes and Tamsil leaves, defeated and speechless. This is perhaps the first time in the novel that Ramatulai takes a stand against her oppressors, and it is certainly satisfying. She proves herself to be more sensitive, smart, and rhetorically deaf than Tamsil. Her outburst, which cuts straight into the heart of things, is a stark counterpoint to the three men's bumbling, awkward admission of Mordo's infidelity earlier in the novel. Chapter 19 The next day, down the din, Ramatulai's old suitor appears. Ramatulai senses that he has come to ask for a hand in marriage, although he lacks the obnoxious confidence that I'm still displayed. Wanting to stay Dauda away from the topic of marriage, Ramatulai begins to discuss politics with him. He is a member of the National Assembly. Ramatulai seizes Dauda about the lack of women in the Assembly. Only four of the 100 representatives are women. She stresses that Women should have equal rights to education and equal pay, and that Senegal has gone too long without a female leader. Dawada vehemently agrees and claims to have given speeches before the assembly on those very issues. He concludes by saying that Senegal has gone a long way. He lives without bringing up marriage. Though this is exchange, is certainly intelligent and mutually respectful. There is something ironic about it too. That is, Dawada has come to Ramatulai, essentially to claim ownership over her, and yet he insists that he wants a greater freedom for women in Senegal. Still, despite the irony, the civil exchange presents a hopeful picture 
of the future of the political discourse in Senegal in both public and private spheres. The two speakers are energized and enthusiastic about their country's future. Some days later, Dawada appears at Ramatulai's door again. Once again, they fall on the subject of politics, but this time, Dawada redirects the conversation to the subject of marriage. He admits to Ramatulai that he has never stopped loving her ever since he first tried to court her. Ramatulai is taken aback, if not entirely surprised. She even feels, as she tells Aisetu, a little intoxicated by the proposal. Tactfully, Dauda tells her mother to lie to think about it, and then he takes his leave. On his way out, he runs into Famata, Ramatu Lai's great neighbor. After the brief encounter, Famata rushes back to Ramatu Lai and informs her that she has met Ramatu Lai's new husband, whose arrival she predicted earlier. Dauda's humility and tact are a breath of fresh air in comparison to some sales cross proposal. Rather than announce his intentions, Dawda presents Ramotu Lai with a choice. Still, Ramotu Lai is by no means overjoyed by the intentions. At most, she is slightly intrigued. Famata's excited reaction is somewhat absurd and in Ramotu's eyes, overly superstitious. Ramotu Lai is a true master of her faith, at least in this aspect of her life. Chapter 20 Ramotu Lai thinks over Dawda's proposal. In solitude, she knows Dauda is the honorable man. She trusts that he will serve as a wonderful father to her children. And she knows that, despite not really loving his current wife, he has always treated her with the most utmost respect, going so far as to involve her in his political life. Famata concurs with all this assessment and encourages Ramatu Lai to accept the proposal. However, Ramatu Lai can't bring herself to love Dauda. As she puts it, she knows in her head that he will make a fine husband, but her heart disagrees. She decides she cannot marry him. Ramatu Lai cannot bring herself to agree with a practical view of marriage, choosing instead to follow her heart. In this way, she rejects the traditional, conservative worldview represented here by Famata's agents, according to which she has essentially no choice but to choose Dauda. Her choice to remain a single mother is as brave as it is honest. Ramatu Lai decides to write a letter to Dauda, explaining her decision not to marry him. In this, she says that, while she holds Dauda in high esteem, it is ultimately only esteem that she feels for him, not romantic love. She also writes that, having only recently been abandoned by her husband, she cannot in good conscience come between Dauda and his current wife. Formata delivers the letters, thinking that Ramatu Lai has accepted that proposal. She learns otherwise when she sees Dauda's reaction upon reading it, angry and disappointed. She returns to Ramatu Lai with Dauda's response, all or nothing, adieu. Ramatu Lai's letter is measured and reasonable, while Dauda's response is cut and somewhat extreme. Though its extremity, perhaps, originates in personal anguish, it also seems to reveal that Dauda is unable to conceive of Ramatu Lai as a friend and a peer. She is only a potential mate. Now that she has turned him down, he has no use of her company anymore. After Dauda, more and more men show up at Ramatu Lai's doorstep to work for her hand in marriage. She rejects them all, which ends her reputation among her neighbors as a crazy woman. As Ramatu Lai explains, all the men seem to be after her inheritance, which she has recently won back from Benito and Benito's mother. Most notably, Ramatu Lai, with the help of her daughter Daba and Daba's husband, has won back the villa that Modo lived in with Benito and her mother. Benito and her mother are evicted from the house, while Benito's mother is terribly upset by this. Benito is indifferent. Ramatu Lai's steadfast refusal of a second husband is completely sensible and financially responsible. Yet, in nearly everybody's eyes, she seems crazy. In other words, the prejudices of the community, the prejudices in the community, do not permit the idea that a powerful financially independent woman can live on her own. But Nito's indifferent reaction to the loss of her house seems to suggest that 
her early marriage, her suffering of all emotion, and that, the greed that seemed to motivate the marriage mostly belonged to her mother and not herself. Chapter 22 Ramatulai writes to Aisatu that Osmani, her youngest child, is also the one to bring her the letters that Aisatu sends her. Ramatulai is greatly comforted by Aisatu's words of comfort and encouragement. She looks forward to the day when they will meet again, writing that the changes their bodies have undergone and the time they have spent apart will be meaningless to them. Their friendship is founded in the content of their hearts. For a mother to lie, true friendship, unlike romantic love and marriage, is impervious to distance, time, and change. Even though Ramatulai and Aisetu have conducted their friendship only through letters over many years, it remains as strong as ever. Daba returns from secondary school. That model, one of Ramatulai's sons attends. He has been getting into trouble with his wife philosophy teacher, who cannot tolerate a black coming first in philosophy and favors a white French boy consistently, giving him the highest mark, even though Maudu is a better student. Both Maudu and Daba understand this to be a great injustice, and Daba wants to tell the teacher off, but Ramatu Lai tries to dissuade her, arguing that doing so will be a waste of energy. It is more important, Ramatu Lai urges, to focus on one's own studies, one's own improvement, and not on racial discrimination. Ramatu Lai and her daughter have two separate ways of responding to this obviously racist colonialist injustice. Ramatu Lai represents a more conservative, pull yourself out by your own bootstrap view of self-reliance. Daba, who is younger and more fiery, seems to favor confrontation and protest in the face of injustice, represents in miniature a greater political question dodging newly independent Senegal. How best to respond to white supremacy and a recent history of colonialism and oppression? Ramatulai lingers on Daba for a while, describing her marriage to her husband Abu. Daba maintains a far more practical view of marriage than Ramatulai has ever, fully accepting that there may come a day when she and her husband decide to divorce. Daba has also decided she does not want to enter into electoral politics, preferring instead the small women's organization to which she belongs. Ramatulai is somewhat bewildered by her daughter's decision, but ultimately impressed by her conviction and the clarity of her reasoning. Ramatulai closes this section of the letter by describing how her daughter Aisetu, Aisetu's namesake, helps her with raising the younger children, and how mother falls helps her when she is sick. Though Dabe's new view of Mari differs significantly from Ramatulai's, Ramatulai is able to understand and ultimately respect her daughter's reasoning. Daba represents a younger, more progressive generation coming into the fore, taking the reign of newly independent Senegal. Ramatulai then represents an older generation that is potentially willing to let the new values and cultural norms rather than bitterly clinging to the custom and causing pain for her children. Chapter 23 Ramatulai recounts to Aisetu a recent episode in which she worked on three of her daughters, whom she describes as a trio, smoking cigarettes secretly in their room. She is shocked by this and doubly shocked by the bewilderment in the face of her anger. Ramatulai wonders whether she has been too liberal as a mother. She lets them to go out at night on their own and worries that smoking will lead them into other more dangerous vices. She knows also that her daughters have started wearing trousers, which strikes her as indecent. Despite her worry, however, Ramatu Lai doesn't crack down on her children. Instead, she simply keeps a watch over them, otherwise trusting them to make their own decisions. The trio's behavior suggests that they are abandoning conventional Senegalese Muslim wisdom in favor of a more progressive, European-inflected outlook. On the one hand, they now have access to greater freedoms. On the other hand, these new freedoms present dangers to their health in quite literal way in the case of cigarette and threatens to admit indulgence and vice. 
Though Ramatu Life disagrees with her children's decision, her ultimately measured response to them suggests an underlying liberal attitude. Chapter 24 Not long after, Ramatu Lai is interrupted during her evening prayers when her two sons, Alione and Malik, come home injured and crying. A group of friends in tow, Malik's arm looked broken. The children explained that, while they were playing soccer in the street, a man on a motorcycle ran over a group of them. They bring the motorcyclist, whom they have beaten up, before Ramatu Lai. He apologizes to her, explaining that he did not expect the boys to be playing in the street and failed to stop before hitting them. Her son's surprise, Ramatu Lai takes the side of the motorist, chastising her children and telling them they shouldn't have been playing in the street to begin with. Malik's broken arm is treated by Modu at the hospital. The motorcycle, symbolically, comes crashing into the children just as modernization has come crashing into Senegal with a sudden influx of both freedom and new dangers. Ramatu Lai's decision to take the motorcyclist's side in the dispute further characterizes her as a tough but consensual mother focused more on educating her children than soothing them in their distress, especially when doing so might compromise their morals or sense of justice. Ramatu Lai now moves to discussing her daughter Aisetu, her friend Aisetu's namesake. Aisetu has become pregnant out of wedlock. Ramatu Lai recounts how she learned of this development. Aisetu had begun to show some sign of pregnancy. She had lost weight, her breasts were swelling, and she was suffering from morning sickness. But Ramatu Lai brushed these signs off as coincidence. However, for Mata, Ramatu Lai's great neighbor, insisted otherwise, until finally, Famata herself confronted Aisetu, learned the truth, and brought her before Ramatu Lai to explain herself. In this case, Ramatu Lai's hand of parenting leads her into blindness. She does not respect the news, or does not want to believe it, or both. Suddenly, Famata, who until this point has seemed like a fanatical quack, is the one who sees the truth of things. Perhaps, conventional wisdom isn't totally useless after all. Aisetu tearfully explains that the father is Ibrahim Sal, a law student that she has been dating and in fact loves. Ramatu Lai is at first angry. How could her daughter do something so careless and so soon after Modus' death? However, swallowing her anger, and remembering how her daughter supported her in her distress, Ramatu Lai decided to embrace Aisetu with open arms and confront the situation with optimism. Famata, who expected Ramatu Lai to put on a more angry, indignant display, is hugely disappointed. By consciously rejecting the part of her that wants to punish Aisetu, Ramatu Lai blocks conventional wisdom, creating for herself a code of ethics that prioritizes love understanding and forgiveness over the dictates of religion and tradition. It is perhaps only a small victory against the forces of oppression that Ramatu Lai contends with throughout the novel, but for Ramatu Lai and Aisetu, it makes all the difference. Chapter 25 Ramatu Lai summons Ibrahim Sal, and he comes to visit her. She is pleasantly surprised by him. He is clean, dresses well, and conducts himself with tact. He assures her that he and Aisetu, he and Aisetu II have figured everything out. His parents would take care of the baby until Aisetu and Ibrahim finish their studies. Luckily, the baby is due during the holidays, so Aisetu will be able to hide a pregnancy and avoid expulsion. Ramatu Lai is impressed by all this and adds nothing to the plan. She writes that she feels that Aisetu has entered Ibrahima's care. Ramatu Lai is no longer her daughter's primary guidance. Ibrahima and Aisetu's open dialogue, careful planning, and their love and mutual respect for each other offer a clear counterpoint to Ramatu Lai's and Aisetu's failed marriages. By Senegalese standards, Ibrahima and Aisetu's union is entirely unconventional. 
even immoral, and yet, in practice, it seems like a far healthier relationship than the others the novel has offered thus far. Their example gives her much to lie you hope. Chapter 26 Ibrahima visits Ramotulai's house often. He is a role model to Ramotulai's young son, and he encourages Aesetu's namesake in her studies. The trio spares him, and Famata remains skeptical, but Ramotulai comes to admire him greatly. Once again, Ibrahima's consensuous and salacious behavior is a hopeful counterpoint to Mother's abandonment of Ramotulai. Spared by Aesetu the second's pregnancy, Ramotulai decides to have a conversation with a trio, her younger daughters, about sexual education. She remarks that, in the past, young girls have been taught chastity, above all else. However, instead of forbidding sex outright, she channels a more modern outlook and decides to emphasize safe sex above all. In addition, she tries to underline the sublime significance of sex in the hope that her daughters would take it seriously. She delivers her lectures nervously and with some difficulty, but her daughters seem unfast and even bored by it. Ramatulai gets the impression that, to them, she is merely stating the obvious. Times have changed, though Ramatulai finds it difficult to adapt to a more modern outlook than she is used to. Her daughters, simply by virtue of being young, have naturally developed more liberal attitude towards sex than the older generation. If Ramotulai's daughters are any indication, the future of Senegal has the potential to be more open, honest, and understanding than ever before. Chapter 27 Aisetu is coming to visit soon, and Ramotulai looks forward to her arrival. Ramotulai reflects further on the face of women in Senegalese society. She is heartened by the expansion of their rights and liberties, but remains worried that their hard-fought gains are unstable, certain social restrictions persist, and men still have a monopoly on power. Ramatulai insists, however, on her faith in the institution of marriage and what she calls the complementarity of a man and woman. Man and wife are the most basic political unit, she argues, as nations are made up of families. With regards to the status of women in society, Ramatulai is hopeful. She knows that societal advances for women are always fragile and difficult to maintain. At the same time, her belief in the institution of marriage shows her more conservative strength and demonstrates her belief that family life and political life are not distinct, mutually exclusive pursuits. In fact, they are inseparable. Ramatulai wonders if Aisetu will appear changed upon returning. She guesses that I said to be wearing a suit, not traditional clothing, and would ask her to eat at a table with utensils in the Western style. Ramatulai closes by saying that she retains hope for her future and that she will go out in search of happiness. Ramatulai's conjecture about Aisetu, though light-hearted, expresses an anxiety that modernization might come to erase Senegalese culture. Tellingly, the novel does not describe the actual reunion of the two friends. That is, it only exists as an address, a kind of monologue, and any response I said to might offer exists only beyond the page. Thanks for watching this video. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share this video.